You've spoken about Richard Feynman as someone you admire. I think last time we spoke, we ran out of time. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to talk to, uh, to you about him. Uh, who is uh, Richard Feynman to you in your eyes? What impact did he have on you? I mean, I think a ton of people like Feynman. He's probably, it's a little bit cliche to say that you like Feynman, right? That's um, almost like when you don't know what to say about sports and you just point to the Super Bowl or something as something yeah. you enjoy watching. But I do actually think there's a layer to Feynman that like sits behind the iconography. One thing that just really struck me was this letter that he wrote to his wife two years after she died. So during the Manhattan Project, she had polio. Um, tragically, she died. They were just young, madly in love. And, you know, the the icon of Feynman is this, almost this like mildly sexist womanizing philanderer, at least on the personal side. But you read this letter, and I can try to pull it up for you if I want. And it's just this absolutely heartfelt letter to his wife saying how much he loves her, even though she's dead, and kind of what she means to him, how no woman can ever measure up to her. And it shows you that the Feynman that we've all seen in like, surely you're joking, is different from the Feynman in reality. And I think the same kind of goes in his science where, you know, he kind of sometimes has this output of being this, ah, shucks character. Like everyone else is coming in there with these fancy falutin formulas, but I'm just going to try to whittle it down to its essentials, which is so appealing because we love to see that kind of thing. But when you get into it, like what he was doing was actually quite deep, very much mathematical. Um, that should go without saying, but I remember reading a book about Feynman in a cafe once, and this woman looked at me and was like, uh, saw that it was about Feynman. She was like, oh, I love him. I read Julia, you're joking. And she started explaining to me how he was never really a math person. And uh, I don't understand how that can possibly be a public perception about any physicist, but for whatever reason, that like worked into his aura that he sort of shooed off math in, in place of true science. The reality of it is he was deeply in love with math and was much more going in that direction and had a clicking point into seeing that physics was a way to realize that and all the creativity that he could output in that direction um, was instead poured towards things like fundamental, not even fundamental theories, just emergent phenomena and everything like that. So to answer your actual question, like what, what, what I like about uh, his way of going at things is this constant desire to reinvent it for himself. Like when he would consume papers, the way he'd describe it, he's, he would start to see what problem he was trying to solve and then just try to solve it himself to get a sense of personal ownership. And then from there, see what others had done. Is that how you see problems yourself? Like that, that's actually an interesting point when you first are inspired by a certain idea that you maybe want to teach or visualize or just explore on your own. I'm sure you're captured by some possibility and magic of it. Do you read the work of Others, like, do you go through the proofs? Or do you try to rediscover everything yourself? So um, I think the things that I've like learned best and have the deepest ownership of are the ones that have some element of rediscovery. The problem is that really slows you down. And this is, for my, for my part, it's actually a big fault. Like, this is part of why I'm, I'm not an active researcher. I'm not, like, at the depth of the field. A lot of other people are. The stuff that I do learn, I try to learn it really well. Um, but other times, you do need to get through it at a certain pace. You do need to get to a point of a problem you're trying to solve. So obviously you need to be well equipped to read things uh, without that reinvention component and see how others have done it. But I think if you choose a few core building blocks along the way and you say, I'm really going to try to approach this um, before I see how this person went at it, I'm really going to try to approach it for myself. No matter what, you gain all sorts of inarticulatable intuitions about that topic, which aren't going to be there if you simply go through the proof. For example, you're going to be um, trying to come up with counterexamples. You're going to try to come up with um, intuitive examples, all sorts of things where you're populating your brain with data. And the ones that you come up with are likely to be different than the one that the text comes up with. And that like lends it a different angle. So that aspect also slowed Feynman down in a lot of respects. I think there was a period when like the rest of physics was running away from him. Um, but insofar as got, it got him to where he was, uh, I, I, I kind of resonate with that. I just... I would, I would be nowhere near it because I'm not like him at all, but it's like a, a state to aspire to.